I'm Nathan, and welcome to Stories with a Twang. Today's episode is called The Long, Long Visit from 13 Mississippi Ghosts and Jeffrey by Catherine Tucker Wyndham. How long is she going to stay? Sarah whispered to her mother. Mrs. Dahlgren gave her young daughter a look. Then on the pretext of going out of the parlor to inquire about the progress of supper, she motioned to Sarah to follow her. Out in the hall of the earshot of the guests, Mrs. Dahlgren said softly but firmly, Miss Percy will stay here at Dunlith as long as she likes. She is your kinwoman, Sarah, your cousin, and I expect you to show her every consideration and courtesy both as kinswoman and as guest. But why did... Sarah started to ask. Mrs. Dahlgren cut her short. That is all... She said, there will be no more questions about Miss Percy. None. Do you understand? Two of Sarah's younger brothers, rowdy and outspoken like their father, raced through the parlor and out into the hall. She talks funny, giggled one boy. She smells funny, added his brother. Before their mother could rebuke them, they had run from the hall out onto the porch where they tussled and wrestled its column length before tumbling over the grillwork banister onto the lawn. Mrs. Dahlgren replaced her frown of disapproval with what she hoped was a countenance of composure. Composure is not easy to achieve in a household with eleven children, before she returned to the parlor. If Miss Percy had overheard the remarks in the hall, she gave no evidence of it. She had risen from the sofa and was standing across the room beside a harp. Who plays this harp? she asked, running her fingers across the strings. She did talk funny. Her native Mississippi drawl had a decided foreign accent and her funny smell was the aroma of exotic perfume. Nobody plays the harp now, at least not often, Mrs. Dahlgren replied. Mr. Dahlgren bought it for Sarah soon after we built Dunleth, hoping it would encourage her musical talents. She took lessons and learned to play rather well, but she never enjoyed the harp and now she appears to have lost interest in it entirely. May I play? Miss Percy asked. Please do, Mrs. Dahlgren replied. Miss Percy seated herself in a broad chair and drew the harp to her. She plucked the strings hesitantly at first, almost as though she feared a rebuff from the instrument, but after a few minutes she began playing a rippling sweet melody. Mrs. Dahlgren did not recognize the tune, yet it seemed as familiar as lullabies she hummed to her children. As she listened, Mrs. Dahlgren decided that Miss Percy had composed the music as she played, drawing from the strings a song of love, of waiting, of rejection, of homesickness, of loneliness. Mrs. Dahlgren brushed away a sudden trickle of tears. Two grubby little boys stood spellbound and silent in the doorway, and upstairs Sarah listened and wondered. Why, Sarah wondered, had she never heard of her cousin Miss Percy? Why had Miss Percy come to Dunleth? What story was the music telling? Mr. Dahlgren, when he came home from his bank, provided no answers for Sarah's questions, though he indicated that he, too, was interested in the length of Miss Percy's visit. She brought just one little trunk, Sarah told Mr. Dahlgren, so she must not plan to visit long. It's an old trunk, battered and scratched. That looks as if it has been on a long journey. No doubt it has, Mr. Dahlgren remarked. He said nothing else, leaving Sarah to wonder if he knew where the trunk and Miss Percy had been. Sarah questioned the servants, but she learned nothing from them, nor were her friends able to provide her with any information about Miss Percy. It was Miss Percy herself who, some weeks later, satisfied Sarah's curiosity, or some of it. Sarah walked into the parlor one afternoon when Miss Percy was playing the harp. On this occasion, she was singing softly. Sarah listened and exclaimed, You're singing a French song. The music stopped and Miss Percy looked inquiringly at Sarah. Yes, I learned the song in Paris. Do you know it? She asked. Sarah did know the song. She had learned it during the months she studied in Europe. So together, she and Miss Percy sang the French words. As the song ended, Miss Percy placed her hand gently on Sarah's shoulder and said, Thank you, my dear, for singing with me. It's been a long time since anyone has shared my music. I used to sing that song with someone I love very much. He and I... Sarah leaned forward eagerly, impatient to hear what Miss Percy was going to say, but the graying lady stopped short, sighed, and said only, But that was a long, long time ago. Then Miss Percy rose and hurried upstairs to her room. Sarah sat alone in the parlor, going over in her mind the things Miss Percy had said and puzzling over the things Miss Percy had not said. She was trying to imagine Miss Percy young and in love when Mrs. Dahlgren came into the room. 
Mother, who was Miss Percy in love with? Sarah asked. Miss Percy? In love? I... I really did not know his name. Actually, Mrs. Dahlgren was telling the truth. She did not recall the name of Miss Percy's lover. She, Mrs. Dahlgren, and the others in Natchez who knew the story always referred to the man in Miss Percy's life as that Frenchman. Some older residents of the river town said the man was a French count or duke. Others contended that he was a high-ranking officer in the French army. Whatever his title or rank, he had accompanied Prince Louis-Philippe later to serve as King of France from 1830 to 1848 on a visit to Natchez in the early 1800s. During the stay of the royal entourage in Natchez, Miss Percy met and fell in love with that Frenchman. Their love affair was the talk of Natchez, and even Prince Louis-Philippe is said to have taken an interest in their romance, referring to them as that charming happy couple. The two, Miss Percy and that Frenchman, were not married during the foreigner's stay in Natchez, nor was there an official announcement of their engagement. But he is supposed to have promised to send for Miss Percy as soon as conditions in France made it possible for her to join him there. So Miss Percy waited. Months passed with no word from that Frenchman. Then, when everyone except Miss Percy had concluded that the love affair was a mere flirtation and that the French visitor had never intended to send for Miss Percy, the letter arrived. Miss Percy shared its contents with no one, but its message made her ecstatically happy. A week later, she had packed a small trunk and had gone to New Orleans where she boarded a ship bound for France. Everyone in Natchez assumed, of course, that Miss Percy had gone to marry that Frenchman, and they were delighted with this happy ending to a storybook romance. Truthfully, not everybody was happy about Miss Percy's trip to France. Certain members of her family considered the journey entirely improper. No properly reared young lady, they contended, went traipsing off without a chaperone to join a man who had not yet married. People close to the family said some of the Percys even told Miss Percy that the Frenchman would never marry her. There were reportedly heated words exchanged and ultimatums issued by older male members of the family. Although this family unpleasantness may have cast a slight gloom over Miss Percy's departure, it did not for one minute lessen her determination to cross the ocean and join the man she loved. Because they knew Paris is a long way from Natchez, and they were aware that communications between the two points was chancy, Miss Percy's friends were not disturbed when they did not hear from her. At first, they thought she was too excited and too busy preparing for her wedding to write. Later, they decided perhaps she had been changed by her life as a member of the French court and that she no longer cared for her former friends. She has forgotten all about us, they said, and after a while they forgot about her, or most of them did. Ultimately, Miss Percy's life in France was neither glamorous nor exciting. Nothing turned out the way she had thought it would. Her lover so attentive and considerate in Natchez became increasingly indifferent and surly in his native France. At first, he had seemed overjoyed to have her with him again. They explored the countryside together, they attended balls at court, they entertained small groups of his friends with their music, he singing to the accompaniment of her harp. They visited art museums and attended concerts, and they purchased clothes for her in shops more elegant than Miss Percy had ever imagined. But they did not marry. Always, it seemed, he found excuses for postponing the wedding plans. After a while, he even refused to discuss marriage, and finally he told her, I no longer find you amusing or entertaining. I wish you had never come to France. Just how long it was before this final rejection came, or how long she tried to reclaim his affections, no one in Natchez ever knew. But it was some years after her departure that Miss Percy quietly returned to Natchez. Embarrassed to face her family, to hear their I told you so's, Miss Percy returned to Mrs. Dahlgren, whom she was connected by marriage, for comfort and for shelter. In the Dahlgren's imposing new home, Dunalith, show place of Natchez, Miss Percy found refuge from prying eyes and gossiping tongues. There, too, she found solace in music. She never left the house, but each afternoon she went downstairs to play the harp. The swish of her full skirts as she descended the stairs announced the daily concert, and often members of the family or servants would slip into the parlor to listen to her plaintive music. Playing the harp was her sole interest, for only in her music could she recapture the happiness she had once known or pour out the burden of a broken heart. For Miss Percy's heart was broken. She still loved that Frenchman, still longed to be with him, if it is true that people can die of broken hearts, that is what happened to Miss Percy. 
One afternoon, she failed to come swishing down the stairs to play the harp. When Mrs. Dahlgren went to see what had detained her, she found Miss Percy sitting motionless in a low rocking chair by the window. The doctor, who was quickly summoned, said she had been dead for several hours. A few days later, after Miss Percy's funeral, Sarah walked into the hall and heard coming from the parlor the familiar strains of the duet she and Miss Percy had sung. She rushed into the parlor to see who was playing the harp, but as she entered the room, the music stopped. No one was there. Mother, Sarah called. I was sure I heard Miss Percy playing, but... Yes, dear, her mother replied. I heard her harp music, too. That was the first of the ghostly late afternoon concerts Miss Percy gave on the haunted harp. For more than a century, those concerts have continued. Residents of Dunleth still hear the swishing of long skirts, followed by plaintive melodies from a harp, as Miss Percy releases in music her love and her longing for that Frenchman. Miss Percy came to Dunleth for a long, long visit. Alright everyone, I hope you all enjoyed this week's story. If you would like to learn more about Catherine Tucker Wyndham, you can go to ktwyndham.weebly.com. I would also like to say happy birthday to my dad, one of the show's biggest fans. If you have any stories you would like me to read on the show, you can send them to storieswithatwang at gmail.com. You can find the show on Facebook and Instagram at storieswithatwang podcast. The show is also now on YouTube at Stories with the Twang Podcast. It would mean an awful lot if you could rate and review the show wherever you listen, and don't forget to share with your friends and family as well. I hope you all have a wonderful week, and until next time, remember that a little twang goes a long way.